Math 1332, Chapter 2, Set Theory. Section 2.1, Introduction to Set Theory, Video 2, Special Sets. In the previous video, we defined a set as a collection of objects, and we defined a relationship between objects and collections of objects called element. Namely, an object is an element of the set if it belongs to that set. We introduced some symbols, one showing that an object is an element of a set, it looked like this, and one that showed that an object was not an element of a set, which was the same symbol with a slash through it. In this video, we're going to introduce some special sets that will be used repeatedly throughout this course. These sets are common not just to Math 1332, but almost every math class ever. You're familiar with some of these sets. Some of them you may not be as familiar with. The first special set we're going to talk about are the natural numbers, which are also called the counting numbers. Each of these sets has a single letter uh, way to represent them. And as we stated before, we usually use capital letters to represent sets of numbers, so it won't surprise you that these will all look like capital letters. The symbol for natural numbers is, as you would probably figure, a capital N. However, in some math classes, it's not just a regular old capital N, but it's what's called a double script capital N. It's like a capital N with an extra leg on the left. Because I'm a theoretical mathematician and I use these symbols quite a bit in other courses, I will be using the double script capital N to represent the set of natural numbers. Uh, although you may see a, a standard capital N, which would also represent the natural numbers. That's nice, but what are the natural numbers? Well, the natural numbers, or the counting numbers, are the numbers you would say if you started counting. From 1. 1, 2, 3, 4. Some ellipses are a good idea here because these will continue forever. If you ever see ellipses with no number ending the list, the implication is it goes on forever. So your natural numbers are the numbers you count with. One, two, three, four, as far as you can go. Now there are two subsets of the natural numbers I want to speak about. In some math courses, these are not given special symbols, like an N. In this course and in the book that I'm using currently, they do have letters specifically for even natural numbers and odd natural numbers. I'm assuming everybody is familiar with, with what makes a number even versus a number odd. Even numbers are 2, 4, 6, 8, so on and so forth. Odd numbers are 1, 3, 5, and 7. But technically what makes a number even or odd is whether or not it's divisible by 2. An even number is any number that is divisible by 2. The symbol for even numbers, as you could probably predict, is a capital E. Now, I haven't seen it written as a double script E, although if I saw it, I would just assume that it's the even numbers. And, as we've already stated, they're the numbers 2, 4, 6, 8. We could also describe them as all natural numbers that are divisible by 2. And of course the odd natural numbers, which can be represented with a capital O, but just to be fancy, we could also represent it with a double script O, are the natural numbers 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. So what are the whole numbers? Well, the whole numbers are practically the natural numbers with one additional element. Instead of starting at 1, the whole numbers start at 0. 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. And yes, there is a reason why the whole numbers are the whole numbers and the natural numbers are the natural numbers. Why do we have a special name for the one set and one for the other? I encourage you to read the history of the development of number systems to get the answer to that question. You'll never guess what symbol represents the whole numbers. If you said capital w, w, you're correct. You said double script W, congratulations, that's even fancier. But if you said any other letter, then you were just trying to be difficult. Warning, I'm about to buck that trend. 
starting with the integers. The letter for the integers is not a capital I. The letter for the integers is actually a capital Z. And if you're wondering why is it a capital Z, I believe it's because of the German word for integers. I invite you to Google it. I've always seen it written as a double script Z and not just a standard capital Z. Well, what are the integers? Well, from this point forward, the sets of numbers get larger by taking the previous set and adding more numbers to it that are missing. For example, if you ignore the even and odds here, because we didn't add anything to create them, from the natural numbers to the whole numbers, we took the natural numbers and then included this, the uh, element zero and got the whole numbers. To get the integers, we're gonna take the whole numbers and we're gonna include all of their negatives. Now, because negative numbers will go forever to the left of zero, we need to start this set with some ellipses and then pick it up somewhere, like with negative three. Negative three, negative two, negative one. At this point, the pattern is established, but just to emphasize that I'm adding more numbers to the previous set, which started at zero, I'll take it from negative three to three with ellipses on both sides. And that's the set of integers, basically the set of whole numbers and their negatives. And if you're wondering where's negative zero, it's in there. Zero is the only number equal to its negative, so it would be redundant to write negative zero. Which reminds me of something that I neglected to mention in the first video. When you're listing elements of a set, there's no need to list them more than once. Otherwise, you're being redundant. For the rational numbers, well, let's talk about what the rational numbers are before I show you what the symbol for them are. Remember, the premise from this point forward is to take the previous set of numbers and add some more that are missing. For example, my integers go from negative three to negative two to negative one to zero to one to two to three, but there's a lot of numbers missing. Because between any two integers, like between zero and one, there are a lot of decimals and a lot of fractions. This is where we pick up the fractions, but here's the problem. When I pick up fractions, I can't list them in a row like it can list the integers. The reason is really simple. When you list the integers, at some point there's no more integers in between. There are integers between zero and three, these two. There, there's an integer between zero and two, this one. But by the time I get to zero and one, there is no more in between. There are no more integers between zero and one. However, with fractions, you can always find another one in between. For example, let's say that I ask you for a fraction between zero and one. You would probably say one half. And then I say, okay, can you give me a fraction between zero and one half? How about one fourth? Okay, can you squeeze one between zero and one fourth? How about one eighth? Can you squeeze one between one fourth and one half? The answer is yes. For example, three eighths would land in there as well as, an, as a, an infinite number of fractions. But fractions are so densely packed, it is impossible to list them in increasing order from least to greatest and include every single one of them. There will always be one in between that you missed. So it's impossible to list these fractions just by listing them with commas in between and have them in increasing order. So how can we write the rational numbers? Well, we have to use a new way to represent a set that I haven't shown you yet, and it looks something like this. Instead of listing everything, let's kind of describe what they look like. To go from integers to rational numbers, we need to pick up all the fractions. And by the way, these integers, they're fractions also. Why? Because I can put them over one. For example, three, I could write as three over one. I could even write it as six over two or 300 over 100. There's an infinite number of fractions I could write that are equivalent to three. But my point is, all of the integers are fractions, are rational numbers. By the way, the word rational means ratio, as in ratio of whole numbers, or integers, I should say. So to describe the rational numbers, the elements of the rational numbers, we're not gonna list them all, but we're gonna describe what they all look like. They all look like fractions. Where there's a number on top, we'll call it P. Let's call it N for numerator, lowercase n. 
and we'll call the denominator D. So our set of rational numbers are everything that looks like this, but we have to state what the numerator and denominator are. So we're going to draw a vertical line here and say that the numerator is an element of the integers. So in other words, the top of the fraction is one of these numbers, and the denominator is an element of the integers. So the bottom of the fraction is one of these numbers. Well, it can, the denominator can be any of these numbers except one of them. Denominators can never be zero. So we have to add the stipulation that the denominator is not equal to zero. We didn't list all the rational numbers, but we described how to build them all. This set contains every object that looks like this. One integer on top of another, where the denominator is not equal to zero. In the next video, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about what's called set builder notation. But at this point, because of the density of rational numbers, it's impossible to list them in increasing order and have all of them. So we describe them. Speaking of uh, rational numbers, the symbol for rational numbers is not the capital R. The symbol for rational numbers is a capital Q. Or a double script Q, as I will always write it. The Q stands for quotient, which means the answer to a division problem, because a fraction is just a division problem. Rational numbers. Now at this point, you might think we have every number that's, that's on here. In other words, if we were to open up a number line and locate the integers, we'll put zero in the middle. It doesn't have to be there, it's just convenient. One, two, three, negative one, negative two to the left. And if we were to locate all the fractions, there's an infinite number of them. There's even an infinite number of them between any two consecutive integers. And you might think, well, we picked up all the numbers, except we haven't. It's a little trickier to explain, but there are some numbers that are still missing. And the easiest way to explain them is to show you an alternative definition of the rational numbers. Without going into details, the rational numbers can also be thought of as all terminating or repeating decimals. All terminating or repeating decimals. And the easiest way to think about this is to remember that a rational number is a fraction, which is just a division problem. If we did a division problem like 16 divided by 5, 5 goes into 16 3 times, 3 times 5 is 15, 16 minus 15 is 1. We could continue the division by putting a decimal and a zero after the 16, a decimal after the 3 in the quotient, and continue dividing. Bring down the zero, 5 goes into 10 twice, 2 times 5 is 10, 10 minus 10 is zero, the division problem is over. 3.2 is a rational number because it's the ratio of 16 over 15, or as a decimal it terminates. Now you may know that some fractions don't have terminating decimals. For example, if I asked you what is um, let's say uh, 5 6 as a decimal. We could set up a division problem. Well, 6 won't go into 5, so we start writing some decimals. 6 goes into 50, mm, how many times? 8 times? 8 times 6 is 48. 50 minus 48 is 2. Alright, let's keep going. Bring down the next zero. 6 goes into 23 times. 3 times 6 is 18, 20 minus 18 is 2, not done, bring down the next zero, and at this point you'll notice that we have a 20 again. So we're just going to keep repeating this 3 over and over and over again. As a decimal, 5 6 is a repeating decimal. The fraction 5 6 is a repeating decimal. Every fraction involving integers will either end or eventually repeat. So you can think of rational numbers as all terminating or repeating decimals. So what's missing? If this contains all the decimals that either end or repeat, then it's missing all the decimals that don't end and simultaneously don't repeat. And there are such decimals. In fact, there's a lot of them. For example, the square root of 2. If you put it in a calculator, you'll get an answer that stops. Uh, I should know more than that, but it's about 1.414, and it's not repeating despite the way that it may look. As a decimal, 
this uh, doesn't end, it doesn't terminate, always, always another number, and it doesn't repeat. It doesn't repeat in the sense that, not in the sense that the digits don't repeat, there's only 10 digits I can use, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, but it doesn't repeat in the sense that there's a pattern that just repeats over and over. You think of it as a bunch of random digits, although they're not really random, there's just no repeating pattern. So we're missing a lot of decimals. And believe it or not, there are more decimals that don't terminate and repeat than decimals that terminate or repeat. So if we throw those missing decimals into the rational numbers, we get what are called the real numbers, which completes this number line, by the way. The real numbers, whose symbol is a capital R or a double script R, we can describe as the set of all decimals, all possible decimals. There's a much more rigorous definition of the real numbers, but it is way beyond the scope of this course. You'll have to take a course called Real Analysis to see that. Just think of it this way. When we add the fractions, we pick up a lot of decimals, but the decimals we pick up either end or repeat. There are a lot of decimals that do neither. Sprinkle those in, and we get what are called the real numbers. By the way, the most common irrational number, which is exactly what it sounds like, not one of these, the most common irrational number is pi. Most people think th pi is 3.14. Pi is approximately 3.14, but as a decimal, it never ends and it never repeats. Hence, it is not a rational number. Closing thought. A number that is real, so belongs to the last set, but is not rational, like these two, are called irrational numbers.